Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome to Bouncing Back, the personal resilience science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I am your host, Tia Hama, and today we are going to be talking about mindful self-compassion and how this impacts your resilience. Today, I am here with Steve. Steve, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Awesome. So... Before we get into it, you've had a very interesting professional life. Um, So, you know, as Stephen Hickman, do you mind explaining who you are and what it is you do? Sure. Um, I can. (laughs) It's a long story, but I'll keep it brief. Um, Professionally, I'm a I'm a clinical psychologist by training after having spent many years uh, uh, in an unrelated field of graphic design. Oh, wow. uh, clinical psychologist who uh, has uh, explored and practiced mindfulness and started the Center for Mindfulness at the University of California at San Diego. And that led uh, one way or another to my current role as an executive director of the nonprofit Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. So uh, I primarily run this center, but I also teach uh, mindfulness and self-compassion and uh, and train teachers of it uh, and literally all around the world. Wow, that's incredible. That's a big jump, like you mentioned, sort of going from, I think you said graphic design to yeah. mindful self-compassion. How did you end up there? <laughs> uh, it was not a planned, you know, orchestrated strategic sort of move. It was really uh, loving the work that I did. I was not, I'm really an entrepreneurial spirit, to, to be honest. Uh, I love the work I did in marketing and advertising and graphic design, but I had always had a, an itch to explore clinical psychology. So I had a business that I ultimately sold so I could go back to graduate school at, um, at a later age than most of my classmates. Um, and um, thought maybe I was going to be a private practice psychotherapist when I got done with my um, education, but one thing led to another, and I landed at the University of California at San Diego as a clinical psychologist. And uh, and really, the key turning point was that I had the opportunity there. I worked in a medical setting uh, in the university yeah. hospital and um, was working with patients with chronic pain in particular yeah, wow. as a psychologist and really um, discovered mindfulness as a powerful means of contending with things like chronic pain and, uh, and found that it was really something that resonated for me personally as well as professionally. And that sort of launched me on this path of mindfulness and self-compassion. Wow, that's incredible. That is such an interesting switchover, but clearly a very important one that a lot of people needed. So before we get into sort of nitty gritty interview questions, we're going to do a get to know you session. Um, So this is the part where we essentially just let the listeners know a little bit more about Steve Hickman. So I'm just going to ask you five questions and you answer as you will. Ready? Okay. Awesome. Okay. So number one, what is a recent book you've been reading? Ah, let's see. <laughs> uh, I am trying to remember the name of it, to be honest. I've actually quite enjoyed it. I, uh, I live in the, in the United States, uh, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, in the state of Oregon on the coast. And on the, in the very northwest corner of Oregon is a, is a town, city called Astoria. It's got a an amazing long history by U.S. standards, uh, and uh, I've read. I've been reading this book on the history of this town and the fur trade in the United States. Really fascinating historical fiction. Yeah, wow. Uh, and I can't, for the life of me, remember the name of it. But um, 
It's a, I, I tend to like historical fiction, fiction. I'm actually listening to a book on ta- uh, audio book right now on the Lusitania by Eric Larson. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so, which is, I think it's called Dead Wake, which I also quite find quite fascinating, far different from my everyday world. Yeah, so. definitely. Oh, that's why we love books though, is because you get to sort of escape and sort of go into a different world. Yeah. Okay. So second question, what is a movie you would recommend? Mm. Ah. This is a hard question. It's okay. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, <laughs> strangely enough, what comes to mind for me is an old movie that is probably my number one favorite movie, which is uh, <laughs> oddly enough happened in, in or took place in Oregon as well. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, wow. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> Something movie. about that movie has resonated with me for a long time. And uh, I've seen it a, a number of times. And actually, a, a major scene uh, in that movie was filmed about 25 miles from here, as I, as I mentioned. That's this, amazing. So. Oh, that's incredible. We love Jack Nicholson. He is, he is yeah. stunning in that movie. He really is. Okay. And third question, do you have a favorite podcast? And if you do, what is it? <laughs> uh, I, yes, it's not particularly lofty, but I have, I don't listen to podcasts a lot, but I listen to one called Smartless by uh, that's led with by three actors, Will Arnett uh, and the other two, I'm blanking on their names now that I'm on the spot. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. It's kind of a fun thing where three, there are three famous guys. I just can't think of the other two at the moment. And they bring on famous guests. Uh, each of them bring their own guest without telling the other two who's going to be the guest until they get started. Oh, wow. And they just have them fascinating conversations um, with uh, with interesting people uh, across the spectrum. They, they actually just listened to one where they spoke with uh, Chef Jose Andres, the Spanish oh, chef yeah. who's doing all of this amazing work feeding people in, in uh, Ukraine right now, but all sorts of places where tragedies have taken place and doing some amazing work. But they go at they expand the gamut from that to Ryan Reynolds and everybody <laughs> in between. Oh, that sounds incredible. What's that one called? Smartless. Smartless. I definitely have to listen to that. Yeah. That sounds yeah. Awesome. Okay. Number four, who is your famous role model? Hmm. Um, you know, I guess I don't know how famous he is outside of my world, um, but uh, his name is Rick, Dr. Rick Hansen. He's a neuropsychologist who and a Buddhist uh, teacher and uh, teaches and writes about um, basically the practice of mindfulness and the power of mindfulness. He's actually a, a, a dear friend as well and has presented at conferences that I've organized and is uh, quite, quite uh influential in circles around mindfulness and compassion and is actually doing some beautiful work right now, bringing together virtually everyone on the planet who's doing work (laughs) around compassion Mm. to form a kind of global compassion coalition to see if uh, those of us doing this work can do even better, bigger work by collaborating together. So he's really a remarkable, kind, warm person who has been a, a big heart and a and a bit of a mentor for me over the years. That's beautiful. And uh, he, his book, uh, just I'll plug his book yeah, since I course. mentioned him. He's got several of them, but the one that, that touched me was his early one called uh, Buddha's Brain. Mm. Okay. So he definitely takes a kind of neuropsychological approach to Buddhist and mindfulness practice. Oh, I love that. That's gorgeous. I, I love neuroscience. If I wasn't sort of in the role that I am, my dream was always to be a sort of a sort of neuropsychologist or something like that, because it's so interesting mm. and it's so crucial to human life. I just, I love it. It's incredible. Okay. Yeah. And final question. Um, what is a course you have completed? It doesn't have to be recent, um, but if you've completed a course recently, then what would that be? Hmm. You know, it's odd that I, uh, I teach all kinds of courses and I'm such a, not a, a student in in, <laughs> in the traditional sense yeah. that way, um, yeah. You know, strangely enough, I teach this mindful self compassion program, and I've never been a participant. I never actually took it as a participant, and now I teach other people to teach it. Um, 
Uh, yeah, you know, I'll tell you what I am learning. Let's just put it this way: less of a course, more of an ongoing practice. Mm. Is uh, at at my advanced age of sixty three, I'm taking up the electric guitar and I'm teaching <gasps> myself. Oh wow! Um, via some online means and a dear friend who's a guitar player. So that's the course. It's an ongoing course, and it's you wouldn't want to hear me play just yet, but I'm going to keep at it. Oh, I don't doubt that you'll learn it very quickly. That's <laughs> incredible. I love, yep, yeah, I love electric yeah. guitar. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite genre of music? Just out of curiosity. Generally, generally rock. I'm kind of a kind of a big fan of Eric Clapton mm. and, um, and that sort of uh, probably classic All rock. Classic I guess stuff. You know. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, exactly. I was listening to BB King on the train. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay, blues would be the other one. So. <laughs> yeah, sure. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you for that. So today we're discussing mindful self compassion. This is something that I'm sure most people are aware of because it's sort of a crucial part of life. But it's something that I think, in sort of a tangible aspect, we're not entirely sort of. Um, consciously practicing it, if that makes sense. So whether that be in your personal or in your professional life. So for our listeners, before we get started, Steve, how would you define mindful self-compassion? Yeah, I think it would be uh, probably more precise. I'm I'm kind of funny about words. So mindful self-compassion actually is the name of a formal program uh, developed by doctors Chris Germer and Kristen Neff, who I'm sure I'll mention again today. Um, so it's an eight-week training program that teaches people to practice self-compassion. What they've done with the name of that is to put together two things, two related but, uh, but different elements, which is mindfulness and self-compassion. And they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. So just to kind of break it down, not to give you a longer answer than you planned on, but mindfulness is this capacity to be fully present in the moment. Uh, the short short definition is moment to moment, non-judgmental awareness. So the natural human capacity we have to be present, but while that sounds really simple, uh, it's not easy. Uh, because we have these amazing human brains that can go off into the future and the past and imagine all kinds of things, we're often not very physically present. But in order to practice self-compassion, one needs to be present, and I can mm. say more about that later. Yeah. So self-compassion, as a, as a definition, a nice way to think about it is uh, being able to treat yourself in times of difficulty the way you would treat a good friend when they're struggling or suffering or having a hard time. Yeah. It's often very easy for us, for our hearts to go out to a dear friend who has a failure or has fallen short in some way or is having a difficult time to be supportive and kind and encouraging. And yet when we have the same kinds of experiences, a vast swath of society doesn't treat ourselves anywhere nearly as nicely as we do our dear friends. Yeah. In fact, when we fall short, you know, we beat ourselves up, we tell ourselves we're not good enough, we will never make it, blah, 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 all that sort of self-critical stuff. So <laughs> self-compassion is learning to just direct kindness to ourselves when we're having a hard time. Beautiful. Wonderful. Yeah, I think that very nicely sort of breaks down because I think it can be quite sort of – not confusing, but it can be a bit daunting kind of to understand sort of what those different things are and how they play different roles in our life. So on this podcast, we talk, you know, about resilience and how all of these things on all of our guests and all of their expertise, how, of all, how all of this affects our resilience. So mm -hmm. for those of you who are maybe new to the podcast, resilience is sort of about psychological resilience in terms of the ability to cope sort of mentally and emotionally with a crisis and being able to understand yourself and sort of make sure that those moments um, you're sort of understanding yourself intellectually and emotionally to be able to sort of work through them instead of allowing them to completely break you down. So before we kind of talk about the relationship between sort of self-compassion and mindfulness and resilience, for you, why is resilience important important in our lives? Hmm. Yeah, I think it has something to do, you know, what came to mind as you were speaking is that, uh, at least in American football, there has been a phrase used 
by commentators, bend but don't break, about uh, playing defense in football. It probably applies elsewhere. But I think that's really, that kind of captures what resilience is about, is, is being able to bend without breaking. In other words, to adapt to circumstances. It's sort of like our shock absorbers on life that it, it allows any anyone to to tolerate the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune of life, <laughs> yes. you know, to hit the bumpy spots without being totally disrupted. So when we're not resilient, when we're overwhelmed, when we're depleted, uh, we become kind of rigid and um, sh- breakable, you know, like even the tallest buildings Um, are built to flex for earthquakes and such like that, right? They're not rigid. They're not fixed. They are actually built in such a way to flow. (laughs) Yeah, that's resilience, right? Uh, And so this is what it's about. There's psychological, emotional resilience as well. So that uh, because life has ups and downs, it has tragedy and sorrow and joy and all of the rest, uh, we can't we can't make those things go away so we have to find a way to kind of navigate with them john kabat-zinn who's uh, one of the western teachers of mindfulness kind of a pioneer in teaching mindfulness in the west says you know we can't you can't stop the waves but you can learn to surf so this is a, another sort of element of resilience is that being able to to contend with difficulty when it arises mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to resisting it or avoiding it which doesn't work. Yeah, of course. And that ties into my next question in terms of one of the biggest misconceptions that we've sort of found on this podcast is that most people think that resilience means being immune to stresses or adversity. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Why do you think people have this sort of misconception about being resilient means sort of being almost numb? Yeah, I mean, it's our natural tendency to think that if I don't think about something or if I avoid it or I resist it, then I'll be free of it. Mm. Um, But actually, you know, it's a little bit cliche, but you'll sometimes say, you know, what you resist persists. We actually find that, you know, the more you sort of try to hold something off, the more it kind of pushes up into your face. So it's, um, you know... uh, you know where this often comes up quite often is people in in really challenging, dangerous professions who think they're not supposed to have feelings, for example. So, I mean, this taps into a whole other area, which is men in particular, being one myself, I know that we get raised to sort of dismiss feelings or to not have emotions yeah. and to think somehow that we're strong if we don't have emotions. It's kind of the same idea. That doesn't actually work. You actually do need <laughs> emotions. Yes. There, there's a reason we're all built in with emotions exactly. because it, they help us function and adapt and roll with the punches and things. So, so it isn't about not having emotions and being emotionless or being disconnected. It's actually about being fully connected but not overwhelmed by things because you have a kind of a strong base. If you think about, you know, physically, and I'm not into martial arts pr- particularly, but if if you're standing there and someone is going to come at you and attack you, as life will do sometimes, you probably don't want to be standing with all of your legs and body stiff and flat. You want to be flexed. You don't want to, have, you know, bend your knees, flex your body so that you can actually absorb the blow and continue. This is that. This isn't just being rigid and not having feelings. It's recognizing that there are going to be feelings and it's human. And there's nothing wrong with them. And one can function with them. Actually, it makes us better people when we can access our own emotion. That's where the term emotional intelligence comes from. Yeah, exactly. And that's so interesting that you, so interesting actually that you brought up martial arts because we had a guest on here um, a while ago and Christopher Chen, if anybody hasn't listened to it, it's incredible. He's a wonderful, he's a wonderful guest. He's a wonderful guy. And he, specializes almost in that crossover like you're talking about in terms of that physical Mm -hmm. resistance and that emotional resistance he teaches um sort of wrestling and martial arts and he works with a lot of football teams in terms of Mm -hmm. channeling um that sort of understanding of being physically resistant and then sort of comprehending that that also informs um the way that you have to be sort of emotionally um, sort of intellectual and being able to understand that emotional resilience. So as someone who 
has sort of worked deeply in the self-compassion and mindfulness field. Um, What are your thoughts on the role of mindfulness in personal resilience? How do you think those two sort of interconnect? Well, I think I think we really can't be very effectively resilient if that's if there's such a term <laughs> if we aren't aware, right? Like if we're if we're acting on automatic pilot, which is something we do as humans quite well and in some cases works fairly well for us to get through the day. If we had to if you think about it, so many things we do by routine every day uh because our brain couldn't possibly uh, walk us through every step of every operation, everything, you know, if you walk into a restaurant and you're hungry and you have to stop and think about how it is you go from walking into the restaurant to, to feeding the hunger, you know, oh, okay, well, first I need to go over here and then I need to sit down and then I need to look at this thing that's a menu, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have a brain that knows the script and can play it all out. So that's great. That's great for a lot of routine things. You know, you don't have to think about when you're driving about every nuance of driving in order to drive. So that's fine when it comes to things like that that don't need attention, but our actual lives and the things that are really um, more unpredictable and unscripted really need our attention so that we can respond in a meaningful way. Uh, I think a, a perfect example that I love to use is if you're just going through your day and you and you notice you have a headache, um, and you just pop, uh, in the U S it's called Advil. I don't know what it is elsewhere in the world, but <laughs> yeah. basically aspirin or whatever. Um, so you, do, so you take that pill, uh, not be, but, and, and maybe the headache goes away, but so that may be fine, but you didn't get a headache because you were low on Advil, right? Your body wasn't saying, Hey, my Advil levels are too low. I need to kind of beef them up. <laughs> right. Um, so something else was going on. You were dehydrated. You were stressed. It was hormonal. You know, who knows what it was? And it may be that the proper response would be to take the Advil. Mm. It's not to say that isn't the thing. But if you're de- dehydrated, maybe the thing to do is to drink water, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so when we're when we're practicing mindfulness, we are actually noticing, oh, you know, in this case, a headache is here. Hmm. Yeah. Look at that. Rather than headache, Advil. It's actually mm. there's something in between. It's 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 a moment of awareness. So when we notice uh, somebody says something and we're about to 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 say something back that we really will regret later because we just reacted, uh, we actually there's a space that happens between stimulus and response that we actually notice. Oh wow, that you know, and that person said that that just that's a sensitive spot for me. And I know I tend to kind of get worked up and go there. Um, And to just the mindfulness is what allows us to see a reaction unfolding inside of ourselves and decide if that's how we want to respond or not, rather than to just be reactive. Yeah. So really mindfulness is about responding rather than reacting. And that's the difference really between resilience lack of resilience really is that capacity to respond in a meaningful way to things when they arise as opposed to a reactive or habitual or or sort of prescripted way yeah no i love that it's so important and it's so crucial because like you said when you're in that moment and especially when you're sort of you know you're in an argument or in the heat of the moment something and something sort of hits you, you need to be able to have that mindset in terms of being like, am I going to do something that is going to (laughs) drastically affect my position with this person or my position with my colleagues or something sort of later on? Um, And it's so important. Yeah. Sometimes I'll say, you know, if you think back to the last interaction you had that that didn't go well, that you don't feel good about how it went, um, looking back on it calmly, generally you can, you can recognize where the problem lie lay. So when you, you know, something happened and you said something you wish you hadn't said, or you, you reacted or you did something you didn't like. So between whenever that happened and now you didn't take a course in how to better manage relationships. (laughs) Yeah. Right. What happened was you calmed down that your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight system is not engaged, which means you can actually think clearly and you can recognize from a calmer place, oh yeah, really, that really touched me off right there. 
Um, you know, if I had been able to just notice that and ride that little wave, I could have, you know, I could have responded much more wisely or compassionately or kindly. Um, so that's what mindfulness practice does. It ends up opening up that space so that in those moments, you're not just caught up by autopilot. You can actually respond intentionally uh, and typically more skillfully. Mm. And generally, the outcomes are better. Not perfect, but better. <laughs> yes, definitely better. So before... Um... For those of you who don't know, obviously before we have we before we book a guest, we kind of go through the topic with them and sort of ask them what they would like to talk about. And I asked Steve if he would like to talk about self love, and he was like, "No, no, we talk about self compassion." So for me <clears throat> and the listeners, what's the difference? Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, there's there's a bit of overlap. Um, self love has all kinds of odd connotations that maybe just veer off from compassion. Nothing wrong with loving ourselves, uh, caring for ourselves. Maybe the, the self-compassion is just a little more um, specific. So, so what I would say, and I didn't really mention this before, it was probably helpful to go back to say, what is compassion mm -hmm. first? Uh, and then we'll work from there. So compassion has to do with suffering. And what I mean by that is that compassion is when you have deep awareness of the presence of someone's suffering, someone else's or your own, and it's coupled with a wish to relieve that suffering. Okay, so it's those two pieces, basically. Um, if you're just aware of someone else's suffering, and there is no wish to relieve it, it's just suffering. And, and it can frankly, without the wish to relieve it, it could kind of burn you out if all you do, you know, I had friends when I first became a clinical psychologist who said, wow, how can you be a clinical psychologist? Listen to people tell you their problems all day long, it every day. Just so person difficult. After person. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, wow, if the job was only that, you know, no way would I want to do that. That'd be mm -hmm. exhausting to just take it all in, to be a sponge. Yeah. But there's a certain context there, which is that people tell their story, share their difficulties in the context of relieving that suffering, of helping support in various ways to, to make change. So this is that compassion has that wish to relieve that suffering. So that's kind of compassion and self-compassion. Just another way of saying it is that it's doing that with, with a U-turn. So recognizing your own suffering and giving yourself kindness wishing to relieve the the suffering so again not to overload it with definitions but kristen neff who's really the world's leading expert on self-compassion has written several books on self-compassion done the bulk of the research um, has defined self-compassion as having three important components mindfulness first one so we've talked about that a bit this ability to be present and to not be over identified with our thoughts, lost in rumination or disconnected. Uh, common humanity is the second piece of self compassion. So, recognizing that when we suffer, when we fail, when we fall short, when we have imperfection, it's actually what we share with every other human being on the planet. That even though we feel bad because we failed the test and feel like we're the only one that ever did this and is ever going to fail or whatever, we actually share that imperfection with every other human being. We all fail and fall short sometimes. So instead of feeling isolated, you recognize the common humanity. And then is the kindness piece, which sometimes gets confused with compassion, um, but kindness in the context of suffering is what compassion is. But anyway, the point being <laughs> self-kindness yeah. is the third element. So we've got mindfulness, common humanity, and self-kindness. You recognize that suffering is here. You recognize it's part of the human condition. And then you give yourself what you need. Yeah. That's the fundamental question of self-compassion is what do I need? Being able to ask yourself that question in a moment, uh, which is something we don't often ask ourselves. Yeah. So that, uh, I think I addressed the question, but <laughs> yeah. that's, that's basically what self-compassion is all about and how it, you know, how it's comprised basically. Yeah. And I find that so interesting that that third element is um, kind sort of self-compassion and sort of you said um, 
understanding and being able to give yourself what you need. And that kind of ties into my next question in terms of how these things are interrelated and obviously sort of like you've mentioned, mindfulness and self-compassion inform our ability to be resilient. And in that last element where you spoke about kindness and being able to give ourselves what we need, how do you think mindfulness and self-compassion should or sort of how do they inform our coping mechanisms? Um, Yeah, so I think just kind of building on what I've said previously a little bit. So mindfulness um, allows us to be aware of what's actually here, not what we think is here, what we wish was here or anything else. It actually allows us to contend with what's actually arising in the moment. And as I said, that's not an easy thing to do, even though it's a simple thing. It takes practice. Meditation is by far the, the most direct route to cultivating greater mindfulness. Um, and so it allows us to be aware of each moment. Compassion, self-compassion kind of adds to that the element of this one here who is present to the moment. In other words, the attention to you as the individual, what's coming up for you? What do you need in this moment? So we sometimes say mindfulness is awareness of the experience and self-compassion is awareness of the experience er the one who's having the experience so mindfulness keeps us present and compassion brings in the warmth and kindness not to say that mindfulness isn't warm but that this is very (laughs) intentional because it's it's the next step so to speak Mm -hmm. that once you're aware of this then you can also say to yourself as you would to a friend wow this is really hard or I'm struggling here, or this hurts. Not, um, I'll often say that we don't practice self-compassion. We practice self-compassion not to feel better, but because we feel badly, Yeah. right? So this is like a very important concept here. This isn't self-indulgence. This isn't just making yourself feel better by being kind to yourself. That's self-indulgence, self-care, nothing wrong with self-care. But self-compassion is is saying, in a moment of suffering, could you just acknowledge that it's here and to meet yourself with kindness just because? So, you know, if you're just like if you're if you're a parent and your child has the flu um, and you bring them a cold compress or a drink or you say sweet things to them or you give them a hug, you don't really actually think that you're treating the flu. You're not going to make the flu going go away by giving them a cold compress. Mm. Well, every- you're giving them all of these. <laughs> yeah. You're giving them those things to comfort and soothe them because they're suffering, because they're struggling and feeling uncomfortable. And that's enough. And so it's the same thing for ourselves. It's not sort of doing this to make, oh, I feel badly, so I'm going to give myself self-compassion so I feel better. Quite often, that's what happens eventually. But that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because it's hard. And uh, that's a tough one to grasp. It doesn't, at first, people have a hard time with that because they just want to feel better. Who wouldn't? Um, But um, the challenge is that really what's sustainable is being willing to meet yourself with kindness whenever bad stuff happens, uh, like a good friend, uh, so that over time, ultimately, you don't magnify and, and worsen those kinds of things, those those experiences by resisting them or fighting with them and things like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Sorry, you go. <laughs> I was just going to say one more thing. A lot of times what this has to do with is um, really what it amounts to is can we contend with our difficult emotions in particular? Mm in difficult situations in terms of how it helps us cope is what I'm kind of getting at is that, um, you know, if anger arises and you just act on that anger reactively, bad things can happen. Sometimes can good things can happen, but sometimes not. If we can meet ourselves with kindness and say, wow, anger is really strong right now. Or I feel I'm feeling anger. There gives you that moment, like that space, like I was saying, that allows you then to to act on the anger in an appropriate way mm. rather than a reactive way that might get you in more yeah. trouble. And, and I say this especially right now um, 
given the state of things in the world, there's always stuff going on, bad things, but there's more than our share, I think, right now. <laughs> Definitely. Right. And I'll often say to people, you know, they're upset and big things, things that they can't control. And we've got, you know, struggles all over the globe. Um, and people feel a bit overwhelmed and they get so upset that this or that thing is happening or this right has been taken away or this person has been elected or whatever it is or war is going on, um, that it's really helpful to remember that these feelings that get stirred up are getting stirred up not just randomly, but because things matter to you, things are important to you. If if you're angry because of in, an injustice, it's because you value justice. If you're angry or hurt by um, you know violence, it's because you treasure safety and security. And these are core values, and that when you can, when you can practice self compassion, and that anger or that sadness arises, and you can say, "Wow, this really hurts," it helps you connect to your value that's underneath the reactivity, and it's the value that can motivate you. So that then, in terms of coping, you can see, "Wow, you know, justice is so important to me. I want to do something to support." justice as opposed to necessarily fighting injustice or reacting against injustice. So it allows you to really learn from your experience and learn from your difficult emotions because you're not just resisting them or pretending you don't have them. You're actually letting them inform you in a, in a meaningful way that allows you to chart action. So this is where I think compassion, self-compassion in particular, more than just awareness and being able to stay present actually empowers us to take action on behalf of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so important. And like you mentioned, it's been a very sort of um, intense sort of two years for the entire world. The, everybody has been facing some kind of adversity. And I guess I have a question for you in terms of during sort of the peak of the pandemic, which for some places has gone a lot longer than others. Right. I know here in Melbourne, we were in lockdown for like the longest time. Um, but in terms of, yeah, the past few years, the pandemic, COVID, how did you see um, self-compassion and mindfulness help people? Hmm. Or how did it help you? I think, yeah. Um, Again, I think I think it's related to being able to meet my my own emotions and struggles with kindness, we, we, rather than reactivity. Especially when you have a certain amount of powerlessness, which we all kind of had, um, all kinds of stuff can happen if you act on that. Um, uh, you can make bad decisions. You can do things that you would regret, etc. All the things that we've talked about before. But I think. Um, what I've actually appreciated, and, and I think I've seen it in so many people, not everyone, and not everyone has this kind of privilege, but um, people stopping and paying attention because they were forced to, <laughs> to their lives, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, like I used to travel a tremendous amount in teaching the work that I teach, 150,000 miles, two years in a row, all over the globe, uh, everywhere. And I was actually about to leave uh, on a trip to Singapore and India around the globe uh, right before the pandemic, well, right as the pandemic was starting and I and uh, didn't end up going, obviously. Um, but people in all of their crazy forward momentum and busyness had to stop and pay attention. And I think what self-compassion for me allowed me to do was to notice the shift, mindfulness probably more than self-compassion. I noticed the shift in the momentum. I actually was staying still. I didn't, I wasn't rushing off. I wasn't thinking about the next thing. I wasn't booking the next trip or the thinking of the next destination. I was here and it wasn't always comfortable, but it helped me to evaluate and reevaluate where I want to be. What do I want to do? Um, it ended up leading me to move from Southern California to here in Oregon wow. because I could, uh, luckily, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I, I like the lifestyle here better. I like the climate. I like the cost of real estate. There are a lot of things. <laughs> I like. Um, but it, it allowed me to, um, 
to be with the emotions that came into, like I said, to sort of bob on the surface of them, to surf them rather than be washed away by them. And I think that's one of the places it allows people to, to just, again, tolerating difficult emotions is a huge thing, not only, you know, on a day-to-day basis in terms of making good decisions, but if you look at bad behavior in the world and there is no shortage of that, that we see in the news, you could, you could, make a case for virtually all bad behavior stemming from people being unable to contend with their own emotional state, you know, whether it's sexual harassment or racism or violence of various sorts, or, you know, all kinds of other things, really, it often comes down to, you know, people unable to contend with their, their own difficult emotions. So this is where I think mindfulness and compassion helps. Yeah, definitely. I think it was so important and I think people paid, like you said, so much more attention to their emotions during COVID because that was pretty much all you did (laughs) because you were just there (laughs) and you were in yourself and of yourself and it was like just you and your emotions, which I think a lot of people found daunting. And in one of your blogs, um, you stated that there is no need in trying when practicing mindfulness and self-compassion. Can you explain what that means? <laughs> yeah. Um, I can only do it by quoting uh, Yoda from <laughs> Star Wars. Please. So he, he has a line well known that is, uh, do or do not, there is no try. So I'll often say that about you know meditation in particular. People say, well, I tried meditating and I couldn't yeah. do it. So usually what that means is the person meditated, they sat down and they paid attention to their breath and stayed present. And what they noticed was a crazy activity up in the mind, the mind <laughs> wandering all over the place. Uh, and, um, and so they just tried harder. The thing is that, that mindfulness and self-compassion, but especially mindfulness, is kind of an effortless thing in a weird sort of way. Even though it's not easy, um, it's actually letting go of effort. That the more we, if we try, we're starting to resist our actual experience. So, you know, if, if I say, don't think about a pink elephant, of course, what's the first thing you do is think of a pink yep. elephant, right? <laughs> everyone, everyone listening to this thought of a pink <laughs> elephant, right? And if you tell yourself, no, don't think about a pink elephant, stop thinking about a pink elephant, I can't think about a pink elephant, you just keep thinking about it, right? The harder you try, the more, you know, what you resist persists, like I said earlier. Yeah. So, so um, when we're trying, that's what we're doing. We're resisting our actual experience. Like, oh, my mind is wandering. I'm going to try harder to meditate. Well, you're just going to try harder to, to make your mind wander, basically. If you let go of needing it to change, if you just say, I'm going to show up for the show, whatever it is that's going on in here, distraction, boredom, excitement, curiosity, you know, sleepiness, whatever it is, if I could let go of trying to get anywhere at all, then I can actually be present. So, uh, and, and if it's, if it's, we actually will say with self-compassion, if it's a struggle, it's not self-compassion. If you're trying to make yourself be kind to yourself, if you're forcing yourself to be kind, that's actually unkind, right? You know, it's like the saying, the beatings will continue until morale improves. You know, you can't beat yourself into compassion, uh, so, so there really is a matter of letting go and just answering that question in the moment. What do I need? It's not trying. It's actually letting go of trying. Um, a few years ago, there were these, I don't know what they call the magic eye posters. There were these, I don't know if you remember them, but they were like a picture. Well, it was like a, what looked like nothing, like a whole series of random dots on the page. And, but if you if you looked at them in a certain way, there would be like an image would appear. Oh, okay, and yeah, it, right. And and it it would happen when you stop trying. So we've used I've used that as an example in a class years ago. Like you would look at it and you kind of stare and strain to try to see something you never did anything. And it was when you finally just let go of trying that the picture appeared. And and the same comes with the, the mindfulness and self compassion. It's actually doing less. Because we're always human doings rather than human beings. You know, we're always busy trying to accomplish something. So this gives us a chance to just let go of trying and show up for what's here. It's not so much what you notice, but that you notice. Yeah. 
Yeah. Be a human being or a human doing. I like that. That's, that's really great. So when people are actively practicing self-compassion for the first time, they can often experience um, a bit of sort of uncomfort that is known as phenomena backdraft. Can you mm-hmm. explain what phenomena backdraft is? Yeah. Um, I mostly just call it backdraft, but um, it's a good example. I'm glad you (laughs) brought it up. Yeah. um, So, so there's a, there is something that happens. uh, This is where the phenomenon works came from. There's a thing that happens in firefighting. This doesn't sound relevant, but it is um, that when a fire person, firefighter goes into a burning building and goes into a, you know, goes in and to a room and there's a door that's shut. The firefighter will put their hand on the door to see if it's hot, because if it's hot, that means there's fire behind that door in that room. And it may well have consumed all of the oxygen so that if if they just swing open the door, the fire could come rushing out in search of oxygen and it's super dangerous. There was a a movie years ago made uh, called Backdraft on that idea. (laughs) Um, Kurt Russell, in case you're interested, ah, but thank you, Kurt Russell. The, the point being that for us as human beings, um, as we're growing up, as we have experiences, especially when we've had really difficult experiences, like times when we really needed compassion and we didn't get it, maybe as a child or a young adult or some up previous point in your life, generally what we do is we store up that those moments of suffering, you know? something bad happened and your caregiver wasn't there for you or worse. They said, you know, you're going to cry. I'll give you something to cry about, or they were abusive or whatever that, that, that moment gets stored away and you figure humans are very naturally resilient so they can get past those things. Children are go through all kinds of horrendous things and somehow or other seem to survive. They figure out a way to get by without compassion basically but it's not a very fulfilling resistance or existence. It's not, it can lead to depression, anxiety, all kinds of things. So what happens is a person might start to just think they're getting by without compassion because every time they needed compassion, they got the opposite. What's really happened is those little coals have been stored up in the furnace of your heart. And what can often happen is then at some later point, you think, you know, really, I need to be kinder to myself. And you start to practice self-compassion. And maybe you put your hand on your heart, which is a kind of gesture of self-compassion. Or maybe you start to say something kind to yourself. And what can happen is just, as you said, you actually get the opposite of what you would think. You would get this rushing out. It's as if you flung open the door of that Mm -hmm. furnace all at once. All of that times when you, you know, you basically you when you give yourself compassion, you're reminded of all the times you didn't get compassion in the past, mm. and it and it hurts. And often it's not so obvious. What often can happen is you practice self compassion and you feel nothing, or you feel something unpleasant or uncomfortable. You, maybe you get angry. Maybe you start to question your teacher or the book you were reading or however you got here, you're mad at your partner, you're upset with the furniture you're sitting on, the temperature, it doesn't matter. Lots of different negative things arise just at the time you figure you're doing the kind thing. So the point being, if that happens for for you, if you practice self-compassion in some form, and I can share a really short practice here in a bit, um, if you encounter the opposite of compassion, if you get this thing that might be backdraft. The point is you're on the right track. Your dosage is too high, right? For you, you need to go slow. You need to be able to just swing that furnace door open just a little bit and then close it again. And then over time, you develop that capacity. You just need to be kind and be willing to be a slow learner, so to speak. And then uh, you, you know, you can make your way into being more self-compassionate. The point being, most people who are super self-critical, when backdraft happens, they think, oh, I screwed this one up too. I, this is never going to work for me. I can't, I can't do self-compassion. I've got to move on to the next thing. It's exactly the opposite. You're doing it. You just need to go slow. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting, yeah, because my next question was going to be sort of recognizing phenomena backdraft and sort of overcoming it, but you've suggested almost like sort of slowing down and sort of um, being more mindful. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, being patient with yourself. Because frankly, you've probably had a lifetime of practicing the opposite of self-compassion. So yeah. why would you expect the very first time that it would be easy? <laughs> you know, yeah. of, you know, a lifetime of never having been on a bicycle and then someone puts you on a bicycle, you know, it's probably not going to go well that first time, right? Same, same idea. And, and in this case, it can often, the practice of compassion, especially if you've had a particularly difficult history or childhood, you may have experienced the need for compassion paired with abuse, harm, you know, danger of various sorts. So that association is going to take a while to break down, you know, this, this is safe now, but you need to feel safe. And so you, you need to just build that sense of safety and not to push yourself. Yeah, exactly. So that ties really nicely sort of into our next section where we talk about sort of um, practice and habit sort of debrief. And I know you mentioned um, that there was sort of an example of um, sort of being able to practice practice this um, mindfulness and this self-compassion. Um, what is a practice that you do to improve your mindfulness and self-compassion? Yeah. Um I w- I'll describe one, and if, if it's okay, I'll lead you through the other. Of course. Uh, uh, in general, um, practicing uh, awareness of breath, basic meditation, mindfulness meditation uh, on a regular basis, that's a topic for another time. It's a longer topic, but um, that's one way of, uh, well, doing that with a practice of warmth. So in other words, I, we have a in the mindful self-compassion program is a practice called affectionate breathing. Um, And it's basically awareness of breath with warmth. In other words, actually noticing how the breath nourishes the body and how it feels to breathe and, um, and to feel the rhythm of the breath and to feel how the breath soothes and nurtures the body and things like that. So it's bringing warmth into the awareness piece. Um, so that's a good, like, formal kind of practice that one could do every day. Um, so there's a little more portable practice that's also from the Mindful Self-Compassion program that's based on the three components of self-compassion that I mentioned earlier. And we teach it as what we call an informal practice, which means it's portable. It goes with you wherever you go. You can yeah. practice it in a moment when you're having a difficulty of some sort. So. Um, what I can do is kind of guide you through a a version of it here where we'll artificially introduce a difficulty, but then later people can do it in any kind of a moment. You know, you're stuck in traffic, you're in an argument with your partner, you know, you hurt yourself, whatever it might be. So, so the idea being that you just take a little time and maybe I'll just kind of walk you through this. It's helpful if the people listening maybe might close their eyes and maybe just turn their attention inward. Turn your attention inward. And just in this space of awareness, as you kind of settle in, as you're aware of being wherever you happen to be, calling to mind something that's really challenging you right now, something painful, something stressful. It might be a work problem, a relationship issue, uh, a health problem you face, something that maybe not the biggest thing that you face, but something that causes some stress for you right now, something you're facing that's difficult. And you might even notice as you call this thing to mind, as you bring it alive in your mind's eye, that it may even manifest in the body somewhere. Maybe you notice a certain kind of tension or warmth or anything at all, something that signals that difficulty is here. And then just in, practicing that first component of self-compassion, mindfulness, just saying, oh, wow, this is a moment of suffering. Or if you're not comfortable with that word, maybe just saying, this hurts. This is hard. Ouch. Just acknowledging the presence of difficulty. And then you might become aware that actually, Oh, yeah, things like this. This is part of being human. Right? Other people feel this 
when these situations arise. This is the common humanity. This is a part of being human. And then the third piece is to ask yourself, what do I need in this moment? How can I be kind to myself? And maybe that means maybe placing your hand and open over your heart or maybe touching your cheek or someplace else that's comforting and soothing and supportive. Just giving yourself what you need. This is the self-kindness. Mindfulness, common humanity, and self-kindness. And letting go of that very brief practice. Now, I did that in a couple of minutes. It can be done in 10 seconds. It can be done in 10 minutes. It's just an opportunity to bring to bear those three components of self-compassion. Mindfulness, common humanity, self-kindness. Yeah. This is a moment of suffering. Suffering is a part of living, being human. And may I be kind to myself. And let go of needing it to change. <laughs> it will likely change on its own, but as soon as you start to check to see, oh, did it work? Am I calmer now? You're sunk because you're trying again. But but this just kind of gives you a sense of, you know, for me, it's like I said, it's portable practice. You know, I find myself frustrated or upset or, you know, hurt or something. It just grounds me and kind of brings in a little sprinkle of kindness yeah definitely no that was so nice <laughs> i heard that the listeners um did that along with us because that was really lovely so my next question um well i guess actually sort of going back to what you do is this something um that you do to improve your mindful self-compassion or is there something else that you sort of actively partake in to help improve that i no, i think this is this is the most uh, the practice that I rely on the most. Um, I and mean, there are some, some beautiful longer exercises and things in the mindful self-compassion program that kind of cultivate uh, a few different things. One, I'll just say very briefly because they're, well, there are elements of it that come up for me on a regular basis. So um, self, self-criticism is a pretty widespread issue. <laughs> Probably, most of the people listening have an inner critic that comments upon their daily activities. Yeah. Um, you know, it looks like it sounds like it might even be familiar to you. In some way. <laughs> oh, <So>. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we uh, every now and then I run into a perfectionist, you know, there's a lot of those around. Right. Um, and, um, and so the question often comes up about like, well, why, like, why do we even have an inner critic? For a lot of people, it's a really horrendous, hurtful, negative sort of experience. You know, it's not pleasant. And uh, there's a whole conversation about why we actually have an inner critic. But if we actually understand that the inner critic is kind of like a really inept parent. In other words, it's tr it's actually trying to be kind to you. It just doesn't feel like it. They're try it's trying to keep you safe. So if you think, oh, maybe I should apply for that that promotion, you know, it says, oh, you know, it, it maybe it'll just tell you, you're not qualified for that. You're not smart enough. You know, you don't have enough skills. You don't have enough education. You shouldn't go for that job, <clears throat> whatever it is. It's, it's not necessarily abusive in most cases. It's actually basically doing this so that if you try and you fail, you don't feel bad. It's, it's actually trying to keep you safe. It's trying to protect you from hard feelings. And if you look at your inner critic in regard to almost anything, if you look a little close, if you can take the time to be tolerant of that difficulty, what you notice is it's trying to take care of you in some way. It's trying to spare you difficulty. And so we have an exercise where we take people through that to sort of see if they can identify when they're trying to change a habit. You know, maybe they want to exercise more, or eat better, or quit smoking or something. Um, and when they don't do those things, when they do smoke, when they eat the wrong thing, they beat themselves up. So if that, if they can see, oh, I see now that that inner critic was actually trying to help me. It was just doing a really terrible job. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like the parent that yells at their kid to, to quiet down, you know, um, then they can actually say, well, I don't need to argue with that inner critic. 
I can actually just say, hey, thanks. Appreciate you're trying to help me. But actually, I, I do want to change, but for other reasons, because I care about my health or I, you know, I want to live to be with my grandkids or whatever it is. And so could I find some words of encouragement that are more motivating, that are more upbeat and positive and helpful to me rather than berating myself for not doing the thing? Definitely. So it's called motivating ourselves with compassion and it's a whole exercise. But quite often I'm kind of looking at that inner critic for myself, just sort of informally saying, oh yeah, there you go. Thanks. Appreciate it. But, you know, I'm going to do this for other reasons. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think, yeah, everybody or at least most people I know have an inner critic as someone who talks for a living. (laughs) Um, I definitely Mm. have my own inner critic, whether that be when you're on radio or TV or podcasts. Um, And yeah, that's a lot of the time just because, yeah, you do have to base what you're doing off feedback if you don't sound right, if you don't look right, then it's probably not doing well. So you form your own inner critic. Um, But a lot of the people who've been doing it for years will start to tell you that that's probably not the best thing or it's not very helpful. You'll have people who have such a strong um, inner critic. I know when I was, I was at a TV channel the other day at a news channel the other day and um, one of the camera guys was telling me about um, one of the broadcasters she was a broadcast journalist and she'd had so much um, feedback that she'd informed her own inner critic based off all this feedback and she could barely speak she could barely spit anything mm. out because she was so heavily criticizing herself that she could barely do anything. And so I think what you said is so important in terms of being able to recognize that your inner critic is trying to help you, but it's not your coach. It's not, it's not in charge of yeah. you. Right. It's, it's like the worst coach you could have. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, you know, we sometimes, at least I know in the U S there are some coaches, sports coaches that are known for being, you know, just yelling and berating their players and, uh, to motivate them. And that's what we think. We think that if we beat ourselves up, we will perform better. But there's actual interesting research that shows that people who are more self-compassionate tend to try harder and persist longer at things than the self-critical people. And it's basically because the self-critical people, when they fail and fall short, because we all do, it's incredibly painful and, you know, once bitten, twice shy, twice shy is the expression. In other mm-hmm. words, mm-hmm. it hurts when you fail. And at some point you start to lose your edge or your motivation to try, because if you try and you fail, it hurts. If you, of course, it hurts a little to fail, but the self-compassionate person motivates themselves knowing, okay, wow, I fell short that time, but I know I have it in me. I can try harder next time. Let me take a look and see what I can do better. They, they're they motivated to keep trying because those inevitable bumps in the road don't hurt as much. We're back to the resilience, yeah. right? you know, the bump in the road. So, so like I said, there's some science behind this as well, that, the, that, you know, beating yourself up gets you a certain distance, but then it has diminishing returns after that, mm. where self-compassion kind of goes the goes the full length so to speak yeah exactly and that's why like you said resilience and self-compassion are so important and so intertwined because to be able to have resilience you need to be self-compassionate and you need to have that mindfulness so going back to what we were talking about before in terms of um, that mindfulness practice and meditating and going through those steps um, for you personally um, do you face and I guess obviously there would be some, but do you face challenges when you do this? <laughs> uh, I would sort of lose all my credibility if I said no. So, <laughs> well, I guess uh, like, because, uh, because you have been doing this for a while and it's a field of your expertise, I guess people are curious, like, yeah. is this something that you still find very challenging or does it come more naturally to yeah. you now? I would say it comes a bit more naturally now, and it's like exercise. You know, you do have to keep it up. Um, and and I still have a human mind that likes to wander off. <laughs> uh, I personally don't really have a tendency. I'm very lucky. I don't have the harsh inner critic that a lot of people have. 
Um, but I often will say, you know, sometimes people will think they're getting off easy because they don't have an inner critic. They don't have a voice in their head that pounds on them. The problem is that usually what that means is that you have a, you have another <clears throat> entity in there that I like to call like the, the inner trickster or the inner seductress, not to cast aspersions on females to say seductress, <laughs> but <clears throat> just to say that it's, it's a little trickier, but it's, it's got the same intention. Mm. And, it, it, and this is the one I struggle with. That's why I'm mentioning it. What I mean by that is that, you know, like if you're trying to, to motivate yourself to go to the gym more often and you do have an inner critic and you say, you know, like today I was going to go run on the beach. Literally, that was my plan. I didn't go. Um, for some people, they didn't go to the beach to run. They would say, oh, you know, you're so lazy. You know, you're never going to, you're not going to amount to anything. You can't do this. You're too, you know, you don't have a strong will. God, who knows what? So I don't have that. What I have is when I had the thought to go to the, to the beach and run today, some part of me said, oh, you know what? You ran yesterday. That's okay. You know, you, you, tr you try hard. You'll do it. You'll go tomorrow. It's all right. Okay. So the end result was the same. I didn't go. And I left and I ended up feeling badly. Um, so that voice, that inner trickster kind of undermined my motivation. Um, so I need to catch that. And that's where I, I kind of, you know, do struggle still because it's, it's an old habit. It's something that developed based upon how I grew up and who raised me. I'm not blaming my parents, but, <laughs> you know, uh, they were indulgent in a certain kind of way, spoiled me in a certain kind of way. So I tell myself I deserve this or that. And not to say any of that isn't true, just to say that there are a lot of things that get in the way of what we want to accomplish. And, um, and we have to be vigilant <laughs> to some degree. And I guess that for me, that's where it's a, a challenge. And the inner critic if you've been living an entire lifetime with an inner critic, you don't think of it as like a hypothesis, whatever that critic says. It's just the truth, you know, like you can't do it or you're weak or you're stupid or you're ugly, whatever it is. It's not like it's offered up like, well, what do you think? Do you think you're stupid? It's basically saying this is it. You are stupid. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so it takes a long time to get to the place where you realize it's just a voice, you know, it's just an echo of some something in your past or whatever it is. And to say just because it came out of your mind doesn't make it true. You know, don't believe everything you think. So it's a, it's a long process. It's an ongoing process. Definitely. So how often do you practice this sort of meditating and mindfulness? Um, personally, for me, the practice is more informal than formal. In other words, like literally sitting down to meditate. It's only a couple of times a week that I find the time to sort of more formally sit and meditate. The more I do, the better I'm doing, the better I feel. Uh, when I'm teaching, I tend to practice more. And maybe it's guilt. I'm not sure what it is. Guilt is not the best motivator for doing anything. Um, but I do feel a certain commitment to that. But in terms of what anybody might be thinking, you know, sitting down for 30 minutes a few times a week is, first of all, it's it's hard enough to do that, but practicing mindfulness and self-compassion can start small. But this is the point. I don't want anyone to think, well, I can't really get anything from it unless I, you know, sit on a cushion 45 minutes a day every day or 30 minutes, two or three times a week, five minutes every day, you know, or just taking a few mindful breaths is a good start and it'll build on itself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't embark on a, on a practice of mindfulness and self-compassion based upon what I've just said for the last hour or so, <laughs> uh, you know, like, don't take my word for it. I mean, hopefully if, if you're interested, you'll explore it. You'll practice mindfulness and self-compassion. If you do it a little bit and you derive some benefit from it, that's the only thing that's going to keep you going. Nothing I say, no yeah. matter how convincing and clever <laughs> and whatever all else I might be is going to get anybody up to practice. It's going to be results. Uh, and what I mean by results is just practicing for the sake of practicing and see what happens. So do you, I know you said you only do this a couple of times a week. So do you set up certain time to do this or you just sort of, sort of decide spur of the moment, like, yep, I'm just going to sit down for like 10 minutes and just meditate. 
It's a, it's a bit of a combination, but I have a routine that it usually happens early in the morning yep. when I'm first in my mm-hmm. office. I'm a morning person. I have my coffee in the morning and then I'll come into my office and, and sit, uh, not like a set, like I always do it on Tuesday and Thursday, <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah. it's sort of more like a function of my schedule. I think if you kind of just wait for the right opportunity, especially when you're new to the practice, it's it's sort of like like how a lot of people are with saving money. You know, if you just like decide to wait until to see how much is left in your bank account at the end of the month, and then that's the money you'll save. Uh, some people can pull that one off, but most people can't. Uh, most people will go right <laughs> to the end and there's nothing left, yeah, right? They, yeah. You have to do it, flip it around the other way and like pull the money out before you start spending, that sort of thing. So it, it's like that with practice as well. Um, but again, it shouldn't be intimidating. And if it's just informal practice, even if it's just resolving to do that self-compassion break every day, like I said, it'll build. You know, if you start to see, oh, wow, meeting myself with a little bit of kindness when I normally would beat myself up, wow, that really felt good to me. I really felt like I deserved that. You'll want to do it again. And that's what will grow. Do you think for people who are starting off and who are sort of generally new to actually sort of taking time to practice mindfulness and self-compassion in terms of meditating, like what we're talking about, do you think people should sort of, you know, schedule out a certain time in their week to actually do it? That's by far the best way to go about it is to just earmark a time, you know, you know, your routine, there's nothing magic about early morning or whatever. (laughs) For a lot of people, it's a great way to start the day. It sort of sets the stage. Um, Some people will say, well, I just have more time in the evenings. And sometimes that works. And sometimes People are exhausted in the evenings and the last, you know, they sit down to meditate and they fall asleep, which happens a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it comes Guilty. into the territory. <laughs> right. So you got to find the moments uh, that work for you when you have a certain amount of alertness. And maybe it's just, you know, closing, if you have an office, closing the door of the office for five minutes at lunchtime or whatever, and just intentionally being present, you know, watching mm. your breath. Uh, you know, another informal practice of mindfulness is mindful eating like actually when you sit down to eat choosing to actually taste your food to actually yeah i've heard about that that, yeah Mm. you know go through all the senses the smell the sight the taste the texture the whole bit um it's it's not an easy thing to do to be honest we're used to sort of eating mindlessly but it's a practice in and of itself to just actually appreciate what you're eating. Definitely. Yeah. I think it's so important. It's, it's very hard, but it's something that, um, I learned many, many years ago, many, many years ago when I was in high school and, um, the school chaplain mentioned it and she was like, you know, just try and, you know, like sit down instead of watching, you know, Netflix while you're eating food, trying to sit there and just sort of appreciate it. And everyone was like, oh, I don't think I can eat food if there isn't something in front of me, like if I'm not right. watching something. Because it's just like a it's a reflex, especially now. Sort of when I was growing up, it wasn't so much of an option because there wasn't sort of an iPhone <clears throat> or an iPad or Netflix wasn't the thing. No, no. Um, so it wasn't so much of an option. But I feel like now because you can have something happening all the time, it is so much more important to take that moment to actually, what am I eating? Like, what is this? And appreciate it. Yeah. We have a pathological fear of boredom in our, in our uh, society today. I think, Mm. you know, I I just look at my son who's 26, who's a, a, he's a gamer and uh, he's, you know, he's got the phone and he's got, you know, half the time when I'm talking to him on the phone, I'm sure that he's also doing something else, (laughs) Um, multitasking, all that sort of thing. Uh, Not to rag on him, but, but we do have a fear of boredom, you know, like, definitely. I don't know what that's about, but it's like, oh, I couldn't just possibly just sit here or I couldn't just eat. um, But there's something, you know, not that you have to do it all the time either, but just see what it would be like to like, you know, eat one small morsel of food. We And the mindfulness-based stress reduction program that I used to teach for years, we start each of uh, the very first session with a practice called the raisin exercise, where basically we give people a raisin and have them eat it mindfully, walk <laughs> them through 
looking at it, touching it, smelling it, putting it on the tongue, mm. chewing it, swallowing it, etc. It's really quite an interesting experience. You start there and work your way up. (laughs) Definitely, yeah. Working your way up to a full meal is definitely um, quite a task, that's for sure. So when it comes to meditation, do you think this is suitable for everybody? Would you recommend it for everyone? Um, I think regular practice of of meditation is uh, is harder for some people than others. Um, I think that if you are someone who for whom a lot of difficulty comes up. If you've had a really um, traumatic history, you, you, I think my meditation and mindfulness is still beneficial. Mm-hmm. I think it would be good to do that uh, with the support of a teacher or a therapist or someone who can support you in that. I do think that it's possible and, and productive for anybody to practice, but I know it's more difficult. Um, sometimes focusing upon the breath, for example, with people who have histories of trauma and things is kind of um, difficult, activating for them. Not to say it's not possible, but it's just challenging. Mm, yeah. um, but otherwise, I think, yes, I mean, I don't think everyone is going to meditate. I would look at meditation and mindfulness and compassion as being uh, the new exercise, so to, so to speak. In other words, I think we will get to the point where we appreciate that practicing this is in the interest of our best selves, our best health. Um, but that doesn't mean everybody's going to do it just like not, not everybody <laughs> yeah. does. Um, but yeah, with the support of a teacher, a course, taking a, a meditation course class, MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction, or other mindfulness programs is the best way to do it. You've got support of a group and a teacher and that sort of mm. thing. Uh, there's there are great books out there um but books are not quite the same as people are there any um just out of curiosity like are there any apps that you would recommend i know a lot of people use sort of mindfulness apps is there any that you particularly like or are Um, you not too fond of the apps (laughs) yeah no uh uh, we're shortly going to have a mindful self-compassion app coming out so i'll think that one is great when it comes out But, (laughs) but i've heard very good things about um Calm and um, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of the other one. Um, yeah, it's not coming to mind. And I actually, uh, in full disclosure, have a very small interest in an app called MindFi uh, by some colleagues in Singapore uh, that's really focused on the workplace and productivity and integrating mindfulness practice into busy professional lives. Mm. So Mindify is that is that one. Interesting. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of good ones. Uh, most of the ones I've seen have been helpful in one way or another. Yeah. And in the end, it's a, it's a low tech practice, but sometimes a little high tech support can help. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Having just those sort of um, recorded kind of instructions and run throughs. I think right. I've got, um, what have I got on my phone? I've got Headspace little orange all oh, right yeah i like that one it's very nice yeah. it's very sweet and they do like cute little stuff on there i highly recommend um so final question based on your experience do you have any other recommendations in terms of improving on this practice or something that you can combine with meditating um <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's such an interesting kind of a question because we're always thinking about how we can do more, <laughs> definitely and better. And if it if it could come in pill form, even better. Um, I think this is one of those things where this is it. You know, like it it as soon as you start to combine things, you're taking it away from what it is in a way. You're starting to do the multitasking thing that our society yeah. kind of has steeped us in, and. Um, you know, people like, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, if I play music when I meditate, I, you know, it's better. Or I have a little water fountain feature that if I meditate with that or, you know, or if I go to this special place that I really like or whatever it is, it's better. Usually what, what they mean is that they notice that in those situations, their attention stays present more. But that's not the point of the practice. I mean, it happens over time that you become able to focus and stay present more, but 
if the mind wanders, mindfulness is about being able to notice the mind wandering. If the mind is preoccupied, noticing it's preoccupied, noticing it's agitated, and being able to just stay present with it, however it is. So, so it's simpler than it's it's simple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. Let's keep it nice so, and basic. So yeah, I would I would resist the temptation to try to enhance it further. It's actually a matter of stripping it down even further, more than anything, to have it be beneficial. And sometimes it's boring, you know. And again, we have that pathological fear of boredom. But it's okay. You can notice boredom too. That's kind of fun. Is that when you become bored, rather than sort of like giving into it and say, "Oh, I'm going to pick up my phone, or I'm going to turn on the music, or I'm going to sit in a different chair," see what it's like to notice what what boredom feels like. Watch it and say, "Oh, look at there! Boredom is arising." Just like anger or sadness or joy or whatever it is, just watching. Actually, watching recognizing boredom. it. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't sound very sexy, but it's actually kind of an interesting <laughs> experience. No, definitely. And like you said, I think, like you said, um, in terms of having that pathological fear of boredom, actually being able to know when you are actually bored compared to when you are just not distracting yourself is um, very different. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. So we're moving into the open mic section of the podcast now. So this is the chance um, for the guests to talk about anything that they're passionate about. It doesn't have to be related to the topic, um, but this is a chance for Steve to bring whatever he wants to the table. So I hand it over to you, Steve. Oh, okay. Well, um, I guess I I feel uh, like I, I, first of all, need to kind of give um, great credit to Dr. Chris Germer and Dr. Kristen Neff the co-founders of the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion and the developers of the Mindful Self-Compassion program. They're my dear friends and colleagues who brought me into the role that I have here and their books are amazing and um, and their work is, is equally so. The Center for Mindful Self-Compassion, centerformsc.org is a great website. Um, and uh, I, I have to, you know, since I'm mentioning books, I did write the book Self-Compassion for Dummies, which is uh based on all the stuff i've been saying here done in the way that i do it which is with a fair amount of humor and fun <laughs> um so uh i'm partial to that book in particular oh, wonderful. So, so i love it so where can people I, I, buy that if they wanted to grab a copy yeah it's pretty much on amazon or wherever you buy books cool. these days it's, <laughs> uh, so, um it's a you know it's a lighthearted way of looking at something that is pretty valuable and serious at times but the book is but like i said i have fun with it mm. try to kind of do that um the mindful self-compassion workbook is another book that's um that's kind of very practical version of the program itself and there's no substitute for actually taking the mindful self-compassion program which is taught by lots of people around the globe so i don't want to go on and on as a as a commercial um but i guess what i do want to say though is because it's on my mind is um as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think it's really important for us to be able to find our way in the midst of the craziness that is this world mm. these days and uh, the various tragedies and challenges. And we've had our share here in the U.S., but they're all over the world um, where we hurt. And like I said, what it, if it's helpful to remind ourselves, I think, that if it hurts, it matters. Yeah. Right? And that if something comes up, if, like I said, if you get angry at injustice or you feel sad about violence, it's because those safety and justice matter to you. And my hope, I guess, is that when these things happen and we are touched by them and we're shook up by them, that we allow ourselves to feel what we feel. That's the self-compassion part. And then it allow it to empower us to take action, meaningful action that makes change in the world. I'm really very focused these days on how does compassion practice help us make change in the world uh, in a big way. Yeah. And I think it has that huge potential. That's why I love this idea of this global compassion coalition that Rick Hansen is forming. Um, but in a, in a bigger sense, it's just every single person on the planet if they can recognize it, if it hurts, it matters, and and tune into that thing that matters most to you, 
an act, do something. Mm. It doesn't have to be reactive. It doesn't have to be big. It just means sh turning the tide in some way by letting your your own feelings be your guide. Um, I would love to see that make a tidal wave of of change in the world and uh, bring a lot more compassion to everything. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think now, I think, well, for a generation who doesn't know any different, I think now is a very important time um, and one of the most important times yet to show self-compassion, to show compassion to others, to be kind and caring and understanding and empathetic and just all of those things that are re required of people who are emotionally intelligent. Um, I think it's such an important time to um, have that and to foster that and to, yeah, make that a global thing, to have that be everywhere and accessible for everyone and um yeah to have that be understand have that understanding um because it's so important just for whatever you're trying to do whether you are trying to sort of go ahead and you know change the world or if you're just trying to improve the space in your work environment it's so essential to human functioning and uh yeah human capacity to be kind and, and love one another it's very important yeah, it's good to remember too that I think our natural state as human beings is compassionate. We all just want to be happy and free from suffering. Uh, we we sometimes have weird and twisted ways of trying to make that happen, and sometimes <laughs> they're they're hurtful. But in the end, if we remember that 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 virtually all of us has good intentions, that we just want to be, as I said, happy and free from suffering, even if we're going about it in an unfruitful way. There's a lot. There's a lot that can be gained from remembering that. Mm. I think uh, that's our primary motivation underneath everything else, um, and that it allows you to give people the benefit of the doubt to actually stop and hear people, even when you disagree with them. Yeah, to have a conversation with them, um, to make to just make a less polarized, less contentious world. And that sounds really kind of airy fairy and whatever but it's it's important <laughs> no definitely yeah it's airy fairy as it sounds it's so crucial it's so important mm. um so thank you for that so that ends our open mic session and we're now just going to move into probably just one question from the audience um we've got a question here from Herdiana who asked how do I convince myself that I deserve self-compassion when I do not view myself as good enough for it. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, there's a, there's there's something interesting in that question, and, and what I mean, there's a lot interesting in that question. But uh, what she's saying is suggesting to me that uh, w when she feels she doesn't deserve compassion. It hurts. Otherwise, she wouldn't be asking the question. In other words, there's some kind of suffering in that. What that means is that there is a part of each of us that, like I said, wishes to be happy and free from suffering. And then there may be another part of us, a self-critical part, uh, that is louder than that first part. Um, but so what I would say is that uh, I'm just trying to think of the best way to kind of get at that succinctly. Um, what we're doing in this practice of self-compassion is not trying to kill the critic. We're not trying to just convince yourself, oh, I do deserve it. I, you know, I do need self-compassion. That'll happen over time. What, what, and that critic is never going to go away. It might get quieter and quieter if if that other voice, that more compassionate voice, has more space. It's like clearing the weeds out in the garden so that the flower can grow, yeah. right? So we just get we give it a little space. We give it a lot of water. We practice self compassion, even when we hear a critical voice saying we don't deserve it. We don't have to argue with that voice. We just practice compassion, and little by little what will happen is that if you kind of do all the things I said for the last hour, and <laughs> um, over time, that, that compassionate voice becomes louder mm -hmm. and the critical voice becomes quieter and it goes into the background and you don't have to win the argument in order to get started. 
you can practice self-compassion, hear what, what that critic is saying and, sa- and say, I see you. I see that there's some part of you that's, you know, there's some part of me that's telling me I don't deserve this. Yeah. It might be some leftover voice of someone from your past. That often happens. Someone who either was hurtful to you or at least didn't know how to give you the right messages, a, a comforting, soothing, compassionate messages. Um, but that's just old voices. Like I said, so keep practicing, start practicing. Don't believe everything you think and don't think that you have to win the argument to get started. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, very important tips. Um, And that'll, yeah, bring us to the end of our audience section. The only reason we do have one question today is because the other questions that we got were pretty much exactly the same. Um, So (laughs) thank you, Herdiana, for um, sending in that question and summarizing pretty much everybody's thoughts on that. Um, Wonderful. Well, that also brings us to the end of our podcast today. Thank you so much, Steve, for being here. It has been such a pleasure and, yeah, had a wonderful time. Me too. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. And um, just for those who want to find out more about you and what you do, where can they go? Um, DrStephenHickman.com is my website. Um, And of course, like I said, the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion is is a good resource too. Beautiful. And go grab a copy of his book. It sounds genius. And uh, for our listeners, don't forget to like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. And we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Steve. Bye, everyone. My pleasure. You have been listening to Bouncing Back, the personal resilience science insights podcast produced by the Life Management Science Labs. Listen to episodes from LMSL's 10 Life Management Perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or other podcasting apps on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps others find us and us grow to bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pr.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Tia Hama. Thanks for tuning in.